Okay, um, thank you, Sinulla, uh, for inviting me and uh, for this uh, talk series. So as we can see that uh, today our uh, presentation is on the Tibetan nomads. And um, we all know that the climate change, uh, it has uh, impact. Uh, it is not only particularly having impact on one particular region. It has uh, global phenomena where, uh, like, uh, especially the Tibetan plateau, it has uh, like seen a great impact of climate change. However, uh, the impact of, uh, on the Tibetan people themselves have received far less attention as compared to what uh, we have seen in, uh, you know, like in, in many of the Chinese researchers, um, they have done a huge research on the uh, impact of climate change. However, there are very little information about the um, impact it has on the Tibetan people especially the Tibetan nomads, they are the ones who are caught up between the uh, climate change impact and the Chinese government policies. So, um, so talking about the Tibetan nomads, like uh, I want to talk about the nomads, uh, what are, how, uh, you know, like um, their way of life. Nomad in general is uh, people who uh, doesn't live continually in one place. They move from one place uh, to another cyclically or periodically, you know. So the term nomads have a um, general of uh, three types, nomadic hunters and gatherers, and pastoral nomads, tinker and trader nomads. So Tibetan nomads are generally considered as the pastoral nomads. They are uh, distinct from the uh, other uh, pastoral nomads which are found in other regions uh, in the world. And uh, Tibetan nomads, they, are, uh, they generally live in altitude of around 11,000 to 17,000 feet. And uh, the environment where they are too cold for crop cultivation. And there are like uh, Tibetan nomads are generally very much dependent on the domesticated livestock, such as uh, yak, sheep, goat, uh, and they migrate from the uh, one established territory to another to find pasture for their animals. So this is a map uh, of a Tibet with the vast uh, rangeland, where nomadic pastoralism is uh, widely practiced. And uh, Tibetan nomads, uh, they have been surviving in this high altitude. Uh, this provides a great example of nomadic practices that were once you know, spread throughout the pastor, um, pastoral world. But now the nomadic uh, lifestyle and nomadic uh, peoples were very hard to find throughout the world. And this, uh, thus, understanding the Tibetan nomads uh, offer an exceptional uh, opportunity to learn about the, their way of life that is quickly uh, vanishing from the uh, face of Earth. So however, uh, due to the uh, um, Chinese government policies of uh, privatizing, privatizing the grasslands and fencing the grasslands and uh, you know, like um, controlling the size of the herds, uh, the nomads, uh, uh, the uh, you know, like uh, and by forcefully resettling Tibetan nomads, they are threatening the uh, very aspects of the Tibetan nomads' culture. So, and in 1990s, uh, you know, like um, the Chinese, uh, many of the Chinese government policy makers and the scientists, they have found that. Um, they have noticed that they, you know, like uh, that the, there are increase in the desertification and the degradation of grasslands, uh, due to uh, in especially in the uh, Sangshan Guan uh, region. This is a region where um, head of the three major rivers that flows into China have its source. So the Yangtze, Yellow, and Mekong, these uh, three rivers have its source in this region. So um, what happened? This um, desertification, or you know, like. Uh, um, uh, grassland degradation in this region have huge impact on the economic and the environment uh, uh, and uh, environment of the people living in downstream uh, in, uh, in uh, eastern China. So um, talking about the uh, Yangtze and Yellow, these are the two uh, um, major river that flows into China and uh, uh, there were like majority of the Chinese population are dependent on these two rivers for their survival. So uh, when we look into um, um, the uh, different uh, government policies which were implemented, and it has a huge impact on the Tibetan nomads. Since the uh, Chinese uh, occupation of Tibet and the uh, coming of the Chinese Communist Party in power, there were a series of policies which were implemented. 
and uh, talking about the um, the uh, the policies and the, the community system, which was uh, first um, started in 60s to uh, late uh, 1970s. So the, during this period, the degradation of grasslands has happened due to the uh, collectivization of the community systems. So uh, the Tibetan uh, PLA have uh, collected all the nomads' properties, everything the nomads own were collectivized. So unlike traditional uh, period where each uh, family, they perform their activities uh, during their communal areas, uh, individual, they have to specialize in one of the two activities, such as herding or milking. So um, the moreover, the government has also turned, uh, you know, all this uh, um, uh, grassland into uh, agricultural land, and not only this, uh, those grassland were uh, owned by the state, and uh, over exploitation of this grassland have uh, increased due to, uh, to increase their productivities. And uh, other than this, and um, th during the uh, uh, commune systems, like each family, they were forced to work, and um, and uh, uh, you know, like, uh, and they were given a work point where like uh, at the end of the year, they, this work point were turned into monetary values and um, this um, monetary, the people were given cash values for each work point. So the quality of life during those period um, in 1960s to 70s have uh, you know, deteriorated as compared to the traditional lifestyle they have lived in the past. So private ownership of livestock were replaced by the people's commune, and all this happened in this uh, one decade from 1960 to 1970s. And then, like uh, with the death of the Mao in 1976, um, the Kabin system has added, and uh, 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 the decollectivization or the privatization system has begun. And uh, in 1980s. Um, mm, uh, nomads were able to gain some control over their animals and their lifestyles, and they were like uh, uh, those animals. Well, after the commune systems, those livestock were equally divided among the nomads. So the household uh, they begin to uh, provide um, produce, uh, and and um, and they can uh, depend on their own. Uh, the people they have their own production and consumptions without depending on the government subsidies. So uh, the pastures were also allocated to the group of three and the six households living in the same pastures. And, uh, they, uh, and, and during those periods, the uh, like Chinese government had encouraged uh, those nomads to produce more of the goods. Uh, and and uh, during those periods, like, um, uh, we can see that it was during the um, end of the uh, Mao's period and the economic reform period where the um, Peoples were like encouraged to produce more of the goods and uh, bring it in the markets. So during those period, uh, um, uh, we can uh, we have seen that uh, do, uh, the many of the Chinese scientists have come up that during those periods, um, most of the um, major uh, during those periods, the number of livestock have increased to 113 percentage, especially in the Tibetan region. The stirred herd size have also uh, grew to unsustainable levels, and the chain of grassland degradation have started during those periods. So, um, as when we look, um, uh, as we see in many of the scientific uh, uh, studies, that uh, during uh, major uh, land degradation and grassland degradation have started in 1980s to 90s. And then, like Chinese government, uh, realizing that the um, uh, degradation of the grasslands, there were a series of uh, reforms uh, implemented, such as the household contract responsibility systems and the grassland law were also implemented to protect the uh, degradation of grassland and to modernize the animal husbandry. So during those period, uh, in 1990s to 2000s, a land lease certificate was issued to nomads. So land was uh, contracted to the Tibetan nomads for 30 to 50 years, depending on the size of herds and location. Uh, this was also to encourage the conservation of pastures and to give the nomads a sense of ownership of their land. However, like um, uh, along with this uh, law, there were like um, many uh, other policies were implemented, such as four-way programs, um, which uh, allowed the uh, fencing regimes and the construction of shelters for Tibetan nomads and livestock. This was meant to control the herd size and the grazings. And late 90s, 
uh, implementation of series of policies and measures were also um, mm, taken place. And then Chinese government have realized that uh, the everything was going uh, wrong. And then there was a rangeland degradation were continuously happening and increasing rate. So um, especially in the uh, Yangtze and the Yellow River source areas. So um, then in, in 2000s, the Chinese government came up with the resettlement policies. And, um, and then in 2003, grassland rehabilitation policies were implemented. Uh, this grassland policies is called, um, you know, like Termo uh, Hongo in Chinese and uh, in Tibetan, which means, uh, uh, like, uh, which means that closing the pastures for, to restore the grasslands. So during this uh, period, the main uh, measure of this policy is to relocate the herders from their grassland to state-built housing. Since then, land lease certificates, uh, which was uh, given during 1990s, um, then all have been nullified, forcing uh, tens of thousands of Tibetan nomads uh, into the resettled camp. And according to state um, media and the Chinese government, uh, this program is to store the grasslands and to prevent the overgrazing and uh, improve the living standard of the Tibetan nomads. And uh, this is the uh, uh, Sangsheng Yuan region, the source of the three great rivers. It is uh, located in the Qinghai areas. And um, as we can see that um, around 40% of the Qinghai area where, um, comes under the Sangsheng Yuan National Nature Reserves. So um, the first relocation has happened in this region. Uh, we call this region as Mati Zasum. And this is the head of the three great rivers of Tibet. Machu, Dichu, and Zachu. And Chinese government uh, labeled this uh, relocation as an uh, ecological migrant, as if they were uh, voluntarily um, agreed to move. So this uh, resettlement, ecological resettlement project was uh, started in 2003 in this region, uh, Sanction Gwen region, and is uh, managed by the Sanction Gwen office belonging to the Depa Development and Reform Committee of Qinghai province. And um, However, uh, we can see that there were uh, both due to the natural and man-made factors, the region have seen a serious degradation of grasslands. And uh, Chinese government assumed that uh, um, it's uh, mm, because of the overgrazing that the grassland uh, degradation is happening in this region. However, the local herders and the many of the local people and the researchers, they have pointed out that climate change, mining, and problem of grassland management uh, contributed to the grassland degradation as well. So in order to restore and protect the ecological environment of this region, Chinese government established Sanjing National Nature Reserve in 2000, and which was recently in 2009 has been turned into a China's um, Sanjing National Nature Park. So there were around uh, 113,000 nomad uh, have been relocated and settled under the environmental migration scheme. So Human Rights Watch, um, they have uh, interviewed a uh, number of people and they have come up with a report that uh, those who were relocated or rehoused, uh, they were, uh, they did not do so voluntarily. They were never consulted or offered alternatives and they were, it was a forceful relocation. So, um, Talking about the a case, uh, which was a done case study done by Fashim Du, he's a um, professor at the uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And during a, a period, uh, during uh, you know, like um, in uh, for for a period of almost ten months, he have done research in Madhu County. So um, he have um, this Madhu County. It comes under the jurisdiction of Golok Tibet Autonomous Prefecture, and this is. Um, uh, in this uh, Golok Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture, and the Madhu County, there were around, ten, out of uh, around uh, 4,000, no, uh, 13,471 people, around 95 percentage are of Tibetans. And out of 95 percentage, 80 percent percentage of these um, uh, household were nomadic herders. So uh, we can see that around 80 percent of the Tibetan living in these areas are nomadic herders and they were forcefully relocated. So in from the period of 2003 to 2008, from Madhu County, around 2,334 people were resettled uh, into the four uh, resettlement village. 
And we can see that um, these are the two villages where uh, this um, Chinese uh, uh, professor he had gone and interviewed with the people. And um, what uh, we have realized, what he have realized that this, uh, from Madhu County, this um, relocation were mainly happened in, um, uh, mainly relocation were mainly done, uh, some were uh, villages were uh, within the uh, county itself, some were in the other counties and other prefecture. So we can, s um, and during uh, this uh, field research, he have found that um, the relocation have had a huge impact on the environment and uh, socio-economic changes and environmental impact. So these uh, nomads have experienced a, uh, huge changes in their li uh, livelihood security, identity, adaptation to urban life, housing, and the degradation, further degradation of the grasslands. Talking about the um, livestock, life, livelihood security, so um, um, he have found that uh, ecological resettlement to some extent have improved the housing, education, medical care, and transportation, but their overall living standard have fall, fell, um, actually fell. So um, the people, they were, um, uh, the people who he have uh, interviewed, uh, he found out that the uh, quality of life after this settlement is generally not very satisfactory due to higher living standard, uh, higher living expenses in cities and the uh, towns. So he, uh, during interview, he interviewed one of the uh, people who have relocated. Uh, his name is Tawa, and he he said that everything here, sorry, everything here costs money. A slice of meat costs 10 RMB. So does a bag full uh, bag of livestock dung. We can't afford them. Yet when we lived on the grassland, we don't need, we didn't need much, very much at all. We got everything from our li livestock. But we came here, we sold all our livestock, tore down our houses, and gave our grasslands back to the state. Now we can't find any jobs. We just stay at home doing nothing all day long. So uh, like this um, resettled uh, herders, uh, there were many uh, similar uh, problems faced by the other uh, um, dependent nomads. So they are mainly uh, dependent on the government subsidies, and there were very less job opportunities available for them. So um, these um, the government subsidies, which were given to these um, resettled uh, herders, they were insufficient to meet daily expenses. They have to everything they have to buy, you know, like food, water, electricity, clothing, transportation, religious activities, everything. They uh, these um, uh, um, government subsidies are insufficient to meet these demands. So, um, however, uh, they some of the resettled. They undertook uh, different activities, such as digging up for caterpillar fungus and kneading blanket for sale, operating a small business, working as a, uh, you know, construction workers. However, this um, unstable and nature of the low-income job resulted in the standard of living declining after the resettlements. And then they faced the identity um, issues, and ma many of the um, uh, nomads, you know, they have um, they experienced a cultural shock and social disruptions. So they uh, most of the day when they uh, move to other new prefectures, uh, they face the uh, issue of uh, increasing marginalization, and um, they are they some sometimes they joke that they are neither remain as a nomads nor as a you know urban settlers. So they are in between, you know, like they're losing their identity. So um, other than this, uh, they also face a uh, problem with the other adaptation to urban life. So um, most of the resettled people, they have very formal, ed less formal education, and, uh, and they most of them doesn't know a Mandarin Chinese language skill. So um, this uh, led to the uh, more, less job opportunities for these uh, people, and the case of cr uh, crimes and excessive alcohol consumption have increased in these resettled uh, communities. So um, uh, the, these people are also facing uh, difficulty in obtaining job because of their low skills and lack of industries in these uh, resettled communities. And then other than this, like they are also facing the problem of housing as well. So um, generally, like although that the government have provided free housing for all these holders, um, but uh, the government did not provide housing for the new nuclear families when they 
when their son and daughters get married or resettled, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, they, um, they just have to share their flats with the, their aging parents. And so uh, there's uh, no way they can uh, buy or build a new house uh, in these resettlement camps. Mm, then, like um, as uh, like we can, we know that Chinese government uh, they claim that it is uh, mainly for the uh, protection of the grasslands and to um, a protection of the grasslands. And however, the research have found out that um, that uh, with the grazing ban and removal of Tibetan and nomads, uh, this uh, uh, the region where the Sunshine region have. Um, there are slight um, increase in the grassland recovery, but a significant improvement, uh, there's no significant improvement in these areas. So um, major problem the, the, the uh, country, county has, is facing is because of the mismanagement of the grasslands. And uh, there were insufficient funds to the uh, organization to uh, effect work effectively. So they, they, since like they, most of the grassland were um, um, you know, fans and they were like abandonment of uh, grasslands. These uh, are neither well protected or nor uh, restored. So th leaving uh, the grasslands empty for long, like it has further uh, led to the degradation of the grasslands. So uh, in uh, the ch as like uh, Chinese government have um, uh, came up with the policies of fencing. So many of the livestock they were like uh, they can't move from one um, grassland to another's. So um, the Chinese government, in order to protect um, uh, uh, best bad pastures from the uh, you know like other good pastures, the, the Chinese government have put fences. So the, that lead to the overgrazing of the some good pastures, and um, and uh, and it lead to the overgrazing of the uh, the good pastures and uh, then like um, in other side like the bad pastures which were like. Uh, has been abandoned for a long time, and it led to the um, further degradations. So um, the, China, the Tibetan local herders they believe that the grassland graze uh, in every number of uh, animals would be in good condition. So manure from these grazing animals uh, can be used as a nutrient to soil and to stimulate the growth of the um, uh, good grass. But however, the, um, uh, with the ban of the um, grazing and they limited the number of the herd size and the fencings. This has uh, further increased the uh, degradation of the grasslands. So as a result of the grazing ban, it seems that it is not man managed and the strategy caused a new problem such as uh, fragmented grasslands and um, we are the fencing and the lack of necessary livestock activity on the grasslands. So um, the what um, with uh, all this um, uh, field work or interviewed and uh, research done by the many of the Chinese scientists, we have uh, found out that the real motive of the scheme is not to just for environmental restoration, but to uh, clear the land for mineral extraction and forcefully remove Tibetan nomads uh, into a purposeful uh, built um, state-built housing where they can be more easily controlled or monitored by the local authorities. So since like uh, 2009, there were around 160 Tibetan have self-emulated uh, as a form of a social political protest against the um, religion and the cultural liberation. But although they are difficult to verify accurately due to the reporting restriction and sensitive security issues within Tibetan region, many seems that uh, they have come from nomadic herders, nomadic backgrounds. So um, once self-sufficient and self-sustaining uh, Tibetan nomads, now they are uh, reduced to a marginal poverty. And um, however, to meet the, their policy goals, Chinese government have relocated these um, Tibetan nomads. And uh, this has led to the uh, uh, further financial dependence on the Chinese government. And uh, that uh, we can see that as a result of uh, nomads resettlements, um, uh, this has led to the serious threat to the cultural and traditional way of life of the Tibetan nomads. Moreover, these uh, forceful resettlements are also a violation of human rights, uh, rights which are enshrined in the uh, international instrument that China has ratified, such as the uh, International Convenient on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. 
the UN Convention on Biodiversity and Indigenous Peoples Declaration of the 2007. So these are the rights like uh, human rights. This is also not only uh, uh, the policies which have impact on the Tibetan people. These are having, a, uh, this is also violation of the human rights of the Tibetan nomads. That's all, thank you.